Good afternoon. Thank you for your patience. Um, we, we, we're waiting for the live stream uh, as we're going to record it so we can begin now. Welcome to our Addis Kitchen Museum. My name is Bagaman Yesarian Goshen, and we're very honored to have a very special guest, Dr. Owen Miller, who will be presenting us a, a chapter in our history that is very important to us. And I'm assuming we have a lot of Sassunsis here today. Um, before we begin our program, I would like to bring to your attention that we have one more lecture next week at 4 o'clock, and then that we will close our season for this year, and then we'll begin next year, hopefully. Uh, there will be a conference in uh, uh, December, December 16, 17, at UCLA. We have some flyers outside, so please help yourselves. Also, we have some books complimentary from the museum uh, for you to grab it. You can take as many as you want. Uh, I want to just mention that Ara Sevanian died, uh, or Ara Sevan died at the Ararat home. He was a prisoner of war under the German army, and he entertained the German officers to save his life. And he was the first Armenian to come as a prisoner of war under Mardikian to the United States in 1948. And this is his life story. So please grab a copy. If you want to take more copies, please help yourself. I would like to introduce to you Rupert Berberian, who will be introducing our speaker. And this today's event is organized with Nasser and the Ararat Eskija Museum. And we have several of the uh, members or the uh, seven committee uh, of NASA uh, present with us. Rupin? Good afternoon and thank you for being here. We'd like to make a special shout out for the CSUN students that are here for extra credit thanks to Bahram Shamazia. So thank you for coming. It's nice to see some younger folks in the crowd. Uh, I want to spend uh, just a little bit of time talking about next week's uh, lecture as well. It's going to be by Shiobhan Nash Marshall, The Sins of, our, uh, of the Fathers, Turkish Denialism and the Armenian Genocide. And also, as Maggie mentioned, this is the 300th anniversary of the Mechitadis Congregation on St. Lazaro Island. And this is the Republic of Armenia stamp uh, commemorating it. And at UCLA, there will be a conference on December 16th and 17th, uh, which uh, I encourage you to attend. It's uh, going to be a very nice uh, conference. Getting back to today's event, it's the massacre in Sassoon, 1894, and the Ottoman colonization of the mountains by Dr. Owen Miller. And uh, he was born and grew up in Eugene, Oregon, and he attended uh, a high school in uh, Berlin, Germany, and I just found out that he uh, also spent some time in East Los Angeles as well. Uh, you may want to ask the question, is he Armenian, Kurdish, or Turkish? And, and he isn't. Uh, his ancestors come from Africa, China, England, France, Germany, and the Philippines. But while studying Ottoman Turkish at Columbia, he ran across a textbook written by Hovhannes Hagopian, which I have the cover here, who was a star professor at Anatolia College in Mursifan, and uh, Hagopian was killed in the, uh, during the genocide, and that kind of inspired Miller to learn more about the uh, genocide, and in turn got him interested in uh, Sassoon, and I'll give you more details on that. His education is primarily from Columbia University in New York City, where he got his uh, PhD degree in international and global history in 2015. He also got a Master of Philosophy degree in 2010, and a Master of Arts degree in 2009, all from Columbia. And he got his Bachelor of Arts degree for, uh, in World History in 2003 from University of California, Santa Cruz. He's currently with uh, Union College in Schenectady, New York, where he's a postdoctoral fellow. Prior to that, he was uh, an affiliated faculty member at Emerson College in Boston, Massachusetts. And he was a visiting instructor at the Pratt Institute of Art and Design in Brooklyn, New York. Before that, he was a visiting lecturer at uh, Cornell University in Ithaca, New York, and uh, he also had several positions at Columbia University, uh, such as teaching assistant, uh, preceptor, and lecturer between 2008 and uh, 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 May 2016. He's really an up-and-coming uh, 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 scholar. He has several uh, publications that are preparing for publication. Uh, including at uh, Stanford University Press, uh, at the Journal of Ottoman and Turkish Studies. Uh, this one supposedly came out in November 2017, so it just came out. 
uh, and also the Etude Arménienne Contemporaine, uh, uh, accepted with minor revisions, and the Comparative Studies in Society and History. Uh, and his next topic of uh, study is the genocides in the Black Sea, refugees, the politicization of religion, and the making of nation states. Uh, he's won several awards, uh, primarily from Columbia Univers University, including in 2014 the Core Preceptor Award for Undergraduate Teaching. He's attended many conferences, and I just want to give you an idea of the topics that he covers, because uh, I'm particularly interested in the topics. Uh, in uh, March of 2018 at uh, University of California, Riverside, his topic was From a Shared Religious Space to Rubble, the Monastery of Sukkarabed, 1849 to 1915. In November 2017 in Washington, D.C., uh, Dr. George Perkins Knapp of Bitlis and the Massacres of 1895. In September 2017, at California State University, Fresno, the colonization of the mountains, Sassoon, Zaytun, Dersim, and the end of the Ottoman Empire. In April 2017, at uh, UC Berkeley, the massacre in the Sassoon Mountains, interpretations of violence at the end of the empire. In January 2015, at the University of uh, Basel, um, the age of Fedei, and the plain of Mush and the mountains of Sassoon. And in November 2014, at the Conference of Middle Eastern Studies Association, in, again in Washington, D.C., interpreting violence in Ottoman Cilicia. His professional activities are particularly interesting. Um, he's the co-founder and member of the Organization for Advancement of Studies of Inter-Asian Societies. Uh, he's the co-founder and member of the History Across Borders Workshop. And this one is the most interesting. He's the co-founder of Kurdish Studies Student Association. And as I mentioned, he's not of Kur Kurdish uh, origin. At Union College, he organized a series of speakers to discuss the plight of refugees. He's a member of the American Society of Environmental Historians, World History Association, and the Middle Eastern Studies Association. And uh, it's very interesting to note that he speaks several languages, including uh, beginning reading in Western Armenian. Without further delay, I'd like uh, to have uh, Dr. Owen Miller come to the podium. So I'd like to thank everyone who helped put this together, first and foremost, um, especially Maggie, and it was, it was wonderful to, uh, and I'm just really honored to be here. This is an amazing honor to be part of this speaking series. Apparently I am the 300, I'm 301st speaker, <laughs> which I find remarkable and really speaks about the great energy involved in putting this series together. Um, thank you, Ruben, for that wonderful introduction. Um, the poet and writer, um, Jorge Borges, once wrote um, a short piece in his collection, um, Aleph. And in this collection, he talked about a man who sets out to draw a map of the world. He first draws the large geological formations, the seas, the oceans, the mountains, and gradually, um, over the course of his life, draws finer details, cities and towns. Finally, toward the end of his life, he looks at this giant map of the world and realizes that it's a picture of his own face. I think that in some ways, that's what we all are doing. And with that in mind, I'd like to return to how I ended up in Sassoon. So I, I came to Colombia initially to study African history, 16th century Timbuktu, to be precise but I became interested in learning Ottoman Turkish and went to the library and picked up the first book I found that reportedly taught Ottoman Turkish. And it was by um, V. H. V. Havonis Agopian. Um, I started carrying this book around and I can highly recommend to anyone in this room who wants to learn Ottoman Turkish that you acquire a copy of this book because it is a brilliant book. I, I thought it was a 
a great read and would carry it around. And eventually I started wondering, who was B.H. Hagopian and what happened to him? I learned that he had taught for many years, for more than two decades, at Anatolia College in Merzifon. And I learned that he had been a star student at the University of Constantinople, a law student, in fact, and that he was a professor of Arabic, Persian, and Turkish, a beloved professor loved by his students. And then I learned what happened to him. Um, on a certain day in August 1915, 61 ox carts pulled up to school. The gendarme demanded um, from the faculty that all of the professors and the students and their families, who were Arminian, uh, come with them on these ox carts. And they were taken from the college. And as George White, who wrote a very powerful memoir about his experiences as the president of Anatolia College, recalls, none returned. None of the, the, mem of the students or the faculty returned to Anatolia College. Vyachagopian was murdered outside of Sivas. And learning about his murder, I, I felt someone had murdered my teacher, my Ottoman teacher, and I wanted to understand, how did this happen? How did the state end up murdering Dr. Hagopian, this famed teacher of the Ottoman language? Why did it take place? I started to study the history of the Armenian Genocide. Um, I was still, technically speaking, supposed to be working on African history, but I became really um, absorbed with this question and haunted by it, how this could happen. And I began to realize that there were some places that were talked about uh, quite frequently and some places which hadn't, and partly because of the sheer ferocity of the killing that took place. One of these places was in the Mush Plain, as you can see here. Uh, I don't have a pointer, actually. Yeah. Maybe I do. Yeah, there is. Oh, this one here. Okay, so there's Mush. Um, Merzifon is over here. And it's in Sivas where Hagopian, um, Professor Hagopian was murdered. But I became um, really interested in the Plain of Mush. So this is the Plain of Mush. It's about 4,500 feet in the air, a volcanic plain, a rich bread basket. It has been for centuries, um, a very rich place. These are the mountains of Sasun behind it to the south. It was the skier in Mush where um, you had the mother cathedral of the Armenian church, um, Sotgarabet, a place that has also begun to fascinate me. I started to learn about the history of Mush and the history of Sasun, um, and that led me further into the mountains here. Um, of course, at least at the beginning of the 19th century, this area, of Mush was not actually ruled by the Ottoman state, not directly. In fact, most of the Ottoman state was controlled by a patchwork of small overlapping sovereignties. Um, they owed allegiance and perhaps occasionally tribute relationships with the center in Istanbul, but for the most part they were independently ruled. And this was certainly the case in Mush and Sasun. Um, the plains of Mush actually were ruled in the 18th century and the early 19th century by um, Emirates, the Bitlis Emirates. Um, and it was only in the 19th century where under Mahmoud II, uh, there he is over there, who began to organize a conscript military. And using um, this conscript military, marshaled the forces to begin to conquer all of these small principalities and polities scattered across the Ottoman Empire and forming one unified state. This is a process that is often called centralization, and that makes sense if you place the camera in Istanbul. But if you place the camera someplace else, you can see that this process was incredibly violent. It, in many ways, resembled a conquest. Um, some of the observations of this conquest um, were discussed by Helmut von Mokte. He was um, a Prussian um, officer who, for five years, 
worked for Mahmoud II. And in his letters to his mother in Berlin, he describes in great detail what this conquest entailed. This is his book here. He talks about the enormous violence exercised by the Ottoman state against all of those who attempted to resist. In Sassoon, actually, soldiers were given monetary sort of rewards for delivering body parts, ears and so on, of villagers in the upland areas that were resisting. So this was done with extraordinary violence, and most of this violence has been erased. But I think that we have to recall this violence when we think about the back story of what happens in Sassoon. Because, eerily enough, the violence that took place in the 1830s under Mahmoud II have echoes and continuation in many ways in the 1890s. So this is the way that the Ottoman state is usually represented, right? It looks like undifferentiated space. You do not have all of these polities that I talked about represented. But in fact, the Ottoman state far more closely resembles this. This is what 18th century Germany looked like, right? With all of these different interlinked and independent autonomous principalities. There have been some efforts to begin to reconstruct the history of these Kurdish emirates. This is from a book by Izadi. And you can see here that right there is Bitlis, right? The emirate of Bitlis, where this takes place with Moush as part of that. One of the very few maps that accurately represents this complexity or the kind of autonomy of the mountains is from this book by Robert Hewson, Armenia Historical Atlas. You can see here that there are two colors. This represents actually the autonomous area in the mountains of Sassoon, whereas this area by the 1860s had been pretty much effectively conquered by the Ottoman state and was under the process of colonization. Now, what did this colonization look like? Well, I guess the question is, what does colonization everywhere look like? And I think that we can define colonization in a variety of ways. But for me, at least, it's about dehumanization and also about extraction of resources. And that is exactly what was taking place here. There was an Ottoman colonization of the eastern parts of its own territory, what some historians have called internal colonization. And this was, of course, conducted not only using conscript militaries and techniques of drilling, but also certain types of new weaponry. This partly even is connected to the history of the United States. After the Civil War, there was a massive arms industry that needed to offload the weaponry. And so one of the first buyers of all of these guns, including rifles made in Providence, Rhode Island, by the Peabody Rifle Company, was the Ottoman state. So the Ottoman state effectively buys the latest firepower and uses this firepower to go into the mountains. And they do this across the Ottoman Empire. But the story, I think, has some special meaning for Sassoon. This violence, I think, had an increase under Abdul Hamid II. Most famously, at the very beginning of his reign, actually right before, you had massacres in the mountainous region of Bulgaria. These massacres, which took place in 1876, also in many ways echoed what would later take place in Sassoon. This was an area that the Ottoman state didn't control very directly, but as part of the attempt to conquer and control, you had enormous violence. The war that resulted from this violence and from the kind of news reports that were borne by telegraphs all around the world led to a very sanguinary war between the Ottoman Empire and Russia between 1877 and 1878. This war, one of the consequences of it, was a massive influx of refugees, Muslim refugees, especially from the Balkans. This began to change the structure of the Ottoman state. Increasingly, it was no longer a state based on difference, 
right, predicated on difference, but rather instead increasingly one based on some sort of um, political Islamic um, underpinning. And it's partly because of the history of the large numbers of refugees coming in um, and the kind of trauma that they experience that you have a kind of continuation of this violence continuing under the rule of Abu Hamid II. In some of the, these um, refugees were actually settled in Mush, and I think it's, it's appropriate for us to kind of bring back the story to the Mush plane. In 1889, an event took place in Mush which set off a cascade, cascading set of protests, first in Mush, then in Istanbul, then around the world. This was the kidnapping of Gulizar um, by Musabe. And I think it's important to note here that um, Musabe is often, is a central part of the story. Um, he, uh, when the Ottoman state conquered a region, there was a question of how they would control it. And one of the mechanisms for controlling the area was to basically empower local warlords to basically rule on their behalf. Um, Musabe's father, Mirsabe, was one of these warlords who helped the Ottoman state control the Mush plains. So when Musabe um, kidnapped and raped a 15-year-old girl named Gulazar, the protests that it represented caused um, ripple effects across the um, Ottoman Empire and eventually across the world. Here we see Gulazar again. Um, and um, I think that it's important to focus on her kidnapping and the kind of the, the protest that really erupted out of that. It's in interesting to note as well, though, that at least in Gulazar's memoir, um, she describes Musabe as, in kind of complex terms, he was, as she puts it, a monster, but his father was a very complicated figure as well. He, um, he actually revered the Armenian saints, and Musabe himself spoke Armenian. So it gets complicated as far as identity in the mountains. But I think it's, it's safe to say that the political structure of power empowered local warlords like Musabe to basically extract resources and you know, kidnap and, and rape folk um, because they were empowered to do so by the Ottoman state. Um, this kidnapping and the protest movement that came out of it um, also inspired and radicalized many individuals. Mehran Zamadian was um, actually a principal um, at a school in Mush and saw for himself the kind of the suffering of the plight of the, the Mush peasantry. He was radicalized by this experience. He had himself been born in Istanbul in a relatively wealthy family, but this experience transformed the way that he looked at things and led him and others like Hambartsa um, and Boyajian to kind of form um, movements of self-defense. Um, these self-defense movements eventually ended up uh, heading to Sasu. Um, I think it's important to mention here a couple things. Number one, the numbers of outsiders in the mountains of Sasu were minuscule. There were never more than one or two revolutionaries in the mountains. This is actually from a map um, that was drawn up by um, Vice Council Hans Hampson. He drew this up as part of a six-month investigation um, that was conducted into the massacres in Sassoon. Going back to the story of, of Sassoon, um, so because you actually had um, this very illegitimate system of warlords, you also had different uh, bureaucrats. You also had bureaucrats uh, who, who made enormous amounts of profit from um, utilizing the Armenian question to their own advantage. Uh, one of these um, uh, individuals was the newly appointed Vali or governor of Bitlis. Hassan Tassin. He, Tassin would use this issue to enrich himself. That is to say, he would frequently um, threaten to arrest wealthy Armenians in Mush. And if they did not pay up, they, he would um, threaten to charge them with sedition to be thrown in prison. When his um, scheme, his corrupt scheme was discovered, 
or there was a threat of discovery, according to many accounts, he tried to cover his tracks by actually concocting a story, a fabricated story, that these few Armenians, like maybe two or three outsiders, and the small groups of self-defense bands were, in fact, they represented a revolution. And he sent accounts to this effect to the central government. When Abdul Hamid II received these accounts, he reacted immediately by saying that, by issuing orders to the military to exterminate the rebels and leave a legacy of terror. Those are pretty much the exact words that were sent out in these orders. These orders went to the brother-in-law of the Sultan, Zeki Pasha, the commander of the 4th military, and he commanded that a massive army convene on Sassoon to destroy the rebellion. This is actually part of the 4th military here. These were not orders that were accepted by everyone in the military. The highest commander in the area, actually, Edhem Pasha, refused to obey the orders. And actually, the local lieutenant governor in Moosh also protested, writing his own account to the massacres and refusing any responsibility for what would take place as these large militaries convened in the mountains to destroy a rebellion. Now, they get to the rebellion, they get to Sassoon, and they find that there is no rebellion. But nevertheless, they leave a legacy of terror. For three weeks between August and September of 1894, about 12 battalions of Ottoman soldiers murdered anyone they found in the valley, the Kavar Valley or the Shatak Valley of the Sassoon Mountains. This was, of course, immediately covered up by the Ottoman state. But some locals, including George Perkins Knapp, who I've written about elsewhere, attempted to convey these accounts to the broader world. George Perkins Knapp was born in Bitlis, educated in Harvard, and along with other missionaries in the region, sought to interview refugees from the mountains, as well as soldiers who committed the atrocities, and compiled the reports. Eventually, his report of Sassoon, I think, remains one of the most in-depth accounts, about 20,000 words long, and very detailed in analysis. Parts of this were published in the London Times. Others also attempted to find out what took place in Sassoon. Many of them have been mostly forgotten, even though they were prominent journalists at the time. Emin Dillon was born in Ireland and educated across Europe. He eventually manages to find his way to Erzurum, where he kind of sends out various individuals to do research for him, and compiled kind of a series of accounts in the Daily Telegraph. There were also accounts by Frank Scudamore in the Daily News, and other reporters as well. And these accounts are actually very useful, because they often were interviews of both survivors and perpetrators. So, just to take the camera back a little bit, as this violence is happening in Sassoon in 1894, you also have a history of violence both in Dersim and in Zeytun, and other mountainous regions as well. We could, of course, easily talk about the violence against the Yazidis of Sinjar, or the Druze folk who were actually murdered in large numbers in 1895 as well. To talk for a second about Zeytun, Zeytun was effectively one of these polities that was autonomous, independent, until the 1860s. It was actually divided into four different sections, ruled by various princes within the city, and it was in some ways a mirror image of the plains below. The plains below, you had Muslim-controlled polities with Armenian peasantry, and in the mountains, you had these Christian Armenian lords who ruled over Muslim-Armenian-speaking peasantry. So, in other words, things get very complicated in the mountains, and I think this is also one of those points I would really like to stress, is that 
we know a lot more about the lowlands than we do about the uplands. And this remains true to this day. These, these are other, other pictures of Zaytun here and Deir Sim down here. Deir Sim, in fact, wasn't effectively conquered until after the fall of the Ottoman Empire. It wasn't until the 1930s when this area, this mountainous region, was effectively, um, the independence of which was effectively destroyed by the Turkish military. Uh, this is a depiction of um, an Ottoman soldier who is um, stabbing actually an area called Gensh, uh, an area close to um, uh, Mush as well. I think that it's important to draw analogies between different apparently disparate events, and I'd like to just take a moment here to talk about something that took place um, in the 1960s. Many of you are old enough probably to remember um, March, what happened in May Lai, Vietnam, but um, basically this 300 soldiers from Charlie Company, an American collection of soldiers from across the United States, went into the village or the town of May Lai and proceeded to murder um, hundreds of women and children. Now, if we went to the American archives, the US archives, and we started to research what happened in May Lai, um, we would have found that 122 Viet Cong were killed and 16 folks, um, uh, civilians, unfortunately died in the crossfire. In other words, I think we should always be very careful when looking at official state documentation of violence. Um, Orrin Henderson, in many ways, uh, covered up the accounts in the same way that the Ottoman state attempted to cover up the accounts in uh, Sassoon. I, I will leave you with um, a kind of a, a bit of a, a piece from one of my favorite writers, and I think this illustrates this complexity about how history is produced. Silences enter the process of historical production at four crucial moments. The moment of fact creation, the making of sources. The moment of fact assembly, the making of archives. The moment of fact retrieval, the making of narratives. And the moment of retrospective significance, the making of history in the final instance. We should bear in mind that when we look into the archives of states, we often find a history of cover-up rather than a history of what actually took place. And it is imperative, imperative for us to try to compile as many accounts as we can from all sorts of sources, memoirs, um, missionary accounts, journalist accounts, um, consular reports, to try to get a better sense of what took place. Thank you. reference to a book that Justin McCarthy published or, along with a couple of co-authors in 2014 in the University of Utah Press. And it's um, a very problematic text. Uh, it's filled with, I think, it would be a great text to read as a class um, because it has so many different problems. It is problems of framing, problems of argument, problems of sources. Um, but to respond to the two points that you brought up, First, the missionaries. I think that the depiction of the missionaries has been for a long time, especially by Ottomanists, incredibly monolithic. To a certain extent, I think it has absorbed the stereotypes that many Ottoman state officials had, particularly by the 1890s, of missionaries. But missionaries themselves, I think if we could take a step back, um, 
were in many cases far better versed, far more in tune with local networks, and in many ways locals themselves. I mean, George Perkins Knapp, for instance, was born in Bedlam and spent 37 of his, I think, 46 years living in the area. He spoke fluent Turkish and Armenian. Um, so when you look at his account, you find that it's filled with local detail. It's, it's not a description of, say, the Kurds did this. It's a description of the rich, um, you know, this particular group, the Bakranle did this, the Belekli did that, <laughs> the Reshkatanle were allies of this group. It's full of fine details that you have to be a local to understand, as he was. Uh, the account by Zeki Pasha, which is the account that Justin McCarthy uses as his central text, is uh, based on someone who was not there at the time of the massacres, who came to Sassoon after the fact, and based his account on a corrupt local governor and rumor. So again, if we were to take George Perkins' Nav account, or Zeki Pasha looking at the broader context, of where they are written and how they are composed. Um, the missionaries often rely not only on accounts from survivors, but also on perpetrators. And that's true in many of the accounts you see, both in accounts of Sassoon, later the Hamidian massacres of 1895, and the genocide itself. So I think, again, his account paints with a very broad brush all missionaries in a very simplistic way uh, that is, I think, very difficult to, yeah, it's very, I think there's a lot of issues there. Um, as far as the particulars of his claims, I think that he, um, I've actually written a pretty long account of the errors, um, and I hope to publish it someday, because I think that it's, there, that particular book is full of those errors, and um, it would be nice to in detail address them. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, please. My maternal grandfather is from the village of Kasha on Sassum. Recognizing that Sassum consisted of many small towns and villages, was there a particular part of Sassum that stuck with the major part of the consequences, or was it all over? It was um, certain parts suffered more than other parts. This is a difficult, oops, let me go back to that map. Okay, so um, the plain of Mush is up here, and you can see here, this is actually, a, the red line is, is the a trip that um, a missionary and a consul, a British consul took um, about a year after the violence uh, in the summer of 1895, and they drew this sketch. The, most of the violence actually was visited in two areas. One is the valley of um, Shadak or Kavar, and then um, Kavorig um, and uh, or Kavori, uh, a series of small villages further up in the mountains, and everywhere in between. Now, Sassoon itself, in the broadest definition of the term, is this huge mountainous region that is. Ex the entire, all of the mountains between Mush and Diyarbakir, the plains of Diyarbakir and the plains of Mush. And so there were some places that were not directly affected uh, or as directly affected by um, these massacres in the summer of 1894, but would later be impacted by violence in 1895. So it, it, there was a high differential rate of casualties and atrocities visited upon different valleys. I would also just bear in mind that Sassoon was an incredibly diverse place, you know, with different mountain valleys having very different identities. And it, it was partly out of this, out of the efforts of the Ottoman state to start to conquer the mountains, the people began to unify in new ways against the state. And so you had these networks that were being built across towns and across valleys in new and important ways. And part of this organization was done by people like Mehran Tamadian, uh, who was an outsider to the region, but was able to kind of act as mediator to help bring up about these alliances. My parents are 
have been formed between some of the city towns or the villages, um, Huliguzan uh, uh, and others in the Shadak Valley, and then the communities up here. Some of the leadership was um, local, um, locally kind of driven. Um, so you did have a few individuals who were helping to organize resistance. But I think that to a certain extent, this was very unexpected. Normally what had taken place um, for years was a kind of complex relationship between uh, some Kurdish nomadic populations which spent part of their, um, especially their winters, in the plains below and would go up into the mountains during the summer. And they would sometimes extract resources from various um, villages. There were also local Kurdish groups that would try to sometimes protect those villages. So there would often be violence. But the kind of violence was, um, you know, a few people would die in a summer, perhaps. It was nothing like what took place in 1894, or even what took place one year before in 1893. What was starting to take place was the Ottoman states organizing um, many different Kurdish communities to act as effectively a cat paw, um, as an instrument to kind of control the region. This is one of the things that many uh, accounts allege um, that what Hassan uh, Tassin was doing was organizing various, um, especially through Naqshbandi networks, uh, Kurdish communities to go into the mountains. At the same time, Mirhan Damadian was organizing different, trying to organize different defenses. Um, the organization was vaguely uh, Hinchak in origin. Um, the Dashnaks were not involved as yet. Um, but I think that the exact nature of how people resisted is very complicated. In Shatak, they actually did try to resist uh, the initial attack, which um, involved mostly uh, Ottoman soldiers who were dressed as if they were Kurdish um, tribes people. That's what many accounts state, that they were not actually um, Kurdish uh, tribal communities, from the Kurdish tribal communities, but rather that they were um, organized by the Ottoman state, and many of them were actually Ottoman soldiers. So initially there, were, there was violence between the um, certain o Ottoman soldiers and these villagers, but most of the villagers quickly abandoned their homes and uh, fled to Mount Antok. So there was very little violence between the villagers and the Ottoman soldiers, although there was some initial violence between some Kurdish groups and some Armenians. Basically, that in, in 1915, during the genocide, um, many people, especially from Mush, fled into the mountains. So estimates are maybe 20,000 people went up into the mountains, and there, of course, had been uh, an attempt to arrange defenses in the mountains. Um, and there, of course, you did have, I think, through August, uh, quite some resistance of the Ottoman soldiers. But r this was not an expected event. This was not something that people had anticipated. Instead, as, as I tried to stress, what this was was the fabrications of a particular governor and his claims that there was a rebellion happening when there wasn't. Incidentally, if we look back at May Lai, the accounts, the initial accounts of May Lai in 1968 were that there were, um, that there were Viet Cong you know, oper operations taking place in this village. So in a similar way, you had kind of the pretext to go and destroy based on false information, in this case intentionally false. Um, and in order to understand that, I think we have to really understand how this corruption really took place and worked. But uh, going back to the genocide, I think that this is not part of my research um, that I've already conducted, but research that I'm going to conduct. In order for this book to be published, I need to talk about the history of the genocide in Sasu. So thank you for that question.
period. So he actually was part of a military um, sort of exchange of officers from in the 1830s. Um, the, eventually, during the 1870s, uh, up until World War One, you had increasing amounts of German, well, first Prussian and then German uh, military advice. But in the case of Helmut von Mukta, he was practically alone. There were, I think, he had one other colleague who was at his level uh, working for Mahmoud II. Um, nevertheless, I mean, he spent, I think, four, four and a half years in the Ottoman Empire, and his accounts are incredibly detailed about actually how these conquests took place. Was the Prussian involved in military, or was it, was it a German desire to access that protection from the Union? In the 19, 1870s, absolutely. In the 1830s, I think it was less so, more kind of ad hoc. But by the 1870s, you're absolutely right, it was part of a geopolitical strategy. Oh, sorry. Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate the fact that you contextualized all this by going back to uh, Moltke and others. Uh, and you mentioned that uh, many of these atrocities and massacres were actually simultaneous that took place in different places, in the Balkans, in the mountains of Lebanon, and in uh, Anatolia. And uh, uh, what I'm, my question is, uh, do you see the, Ru the Russo-Turkish or the Turco-Russian War of 1876-1878 as a kind of watershed, a turning point? Because in, as, as I grow older and read more and more, for me, that seems to be an absolutely crucial turning point, not only in Middle Eastern history, but in even European history, because some of the things that are happening right now are the result of events that occurred then. Uh, would you, you have any comment on that? I think that you're absolutely correct, um, that it was a watershed event. That is to say, it changed the course of history. Um, this war was fought both in the Balkans and in Eastern Anatolia, it devastated both of these areas, causing an immense loss of life. Um, one of the results, as I mentioned, was massive influx of refugees, and actually refugees going both directions. Uh, we have to remember that what you basically had was continuous um, over the course of the 19th century as these wars between uh, you know, Russia and the Ottoman Empire took place, that each one of them resulted in huge refugee flows. And that changed the balance of power, but also caused new questions and struggles over resources, and also changed the kind of politicization. Um, so as people are forced out of a place, say the Caucasus for being Muslim, they now might think uh, more intensely uh, along that particular um, identity. And before they might have had you know, local religious practices which didn't necessarily even bear that much resemblance to normative Islam, but now they have the sense that they are Muslim because the Russian military forced them out. And I think that that story has to be integrated in many ways with this larger story of violence that's taking place because for the most part, Ottoman historians have focused on Russian Ottoman wars or Habsburg, Habsburg Ottoman wars but they haven't focused on the internal wars that are taking place continuously. And 1870s it was a watershed, in a transformation of that, both in the sense of technology and the scope. So I think that's absolutely a very good point. So, okay, so the, the, the Ottoman military um, path from Mush, it's about a six 
hour by horseback trip through um, this path here to this first valley. You have, um, they started to destroy the villages here and uh, camped out in Guliguzan. The people from this area, the survivors of this attack, fled to Mount Antak here. Um, others scattered all around the area. The Ottoman military then proceeded um, to Talori or Kalvorik uh, up here uh, and destroyed this region. They did. They then uh, kind of had a base here in Geliguzon and another one in Kalvorik and they sent out expeditions to basically murder anyone they found um, for three weeks. Zeki Pasha actually arrived and um, was stunned to see what was happening. He hadn't expected um, that this, the killing would take place in this way. Uh, he, by all accounts, put a stop to it after three weeks, um, at which point uh, he then wrote an account which covered up the massacres themselves, blaming it entirely on Ishkia or bandits. Um, this account, of course, has become a central part of Turkish nationalist historiography um, and continues to this day. The book that was mentioned earlier by Justin McCarthy utilizes that text. Um, but you did have quite a few people who were uh, attempting to have shelter here at Mount Antok. There's pictures of that mountain here, there. This is Mount Antok here. So they fled up into the up through here into the areas around the mountain some of which were difficult to traverse. These, these would be the south of Mush, yes. This is right directly to the south of Mush. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Well, in the case of Sassoon and the Hamidian massacres that followed in 1895, I don't think there was quite a bit of German involvement. The question about German involvement in the genocide, I think, is a very important topic, and one which, for many years, I think there was uh, an effort by some German historians to distance themselves from the genocide and for showing the ways in which the German state um, aided and embedded the Ottoman military and continuously looked the other way. So I think that research is, there's now quite a few historians who are examining the complicity of the German state in the Armenian genocide, uh, including, of course, in the violence in Mush uh, during the genocide of the 80,000 peasants, Armenian folk who lived in the plains, the majority were, were murdered in situ, in Mush. So of course, the I would say that the German state bears some responsibility for those murders. Um, as far as those in Sassoon in 1894, I'm not aware of any. As far as the, the question of finance, I think, again, we have to think about the larger questions of how these structures operated. Up until the Crimean War, um, the Ottoman state did not have external loans. That is to say, all of its loans were actually to local bankers, local set off. This was a very transformative sort of thing because it, it started to uh, transform the structure of the Ottoman state itself. Before, um, a very close relationship with the local Saras was necessary. Many of these Saras were Armenian, so local, um, the Ottoman palace, the Ottoman state had a very tight relationship up until the 1850s. And then increasingly you had this finance relationship with bankers in uh, Paris and London in particular, but also eventually also in Germany.
complicated question. Certain Kurdish groups, um, like the Belekle, who are over here, um, are they speak a language which <laughs> has Armenian words in it, and they revere the Armenian saints. And many people in the mountains who are Armenian Apostolic speak Kurdish. So sometimes you have people who revere the saints and are seen as Kurdish, and then there's other times when you had people who were Christians but spoke Kurdish. So the question of what it means to be Kurdish is a very complicated question. But more broadly speaking, there were Kurdish communities throughout Sasun, throughout the Sasun Mountains in various places. But I think that we can identify two different uh, broad uh, types of Kurdish communities. One were the folks who lived um, often closely connected to, uh, say, the people of Sasun, uh, the mountaineers. And then there were other people who were kind of like semi-residents who were there during the summer months to graze their animals. Um, and those relationships obviously went through enormous transformations during the 19th century. It's very difficult to say that they were not changed by the Ottoman state control of this region, which attempted to rule by pitting people against each other. So symbiotic relationships that had existed were transformed into um, rivalries that were utilized as a mechanism of control. Sorry, that was a very long answer to a short question. But thank you. I'm not sure if I understood you correctly. You said that the, do we know that uh, uh, Hitler and the from the Sassoon were the first party who was organizing an uprising in Sassoon? So is that a case that must directly part of that? So the extent to which they were organizing an uprising, I think, is heavily debated. It seems from a lot of evidence, including the missionary accounts at least, that they were organizing self-defense bands. And that is to say that you had raids, like the raid that took Gulazar, and that these were attempts to maintain some sort of local protection. It, a good example would be what was happening in the peasant, to the peasantry below in the plain of Mush. They had been impoverished, particularly because of these questions of the transformation of finance and the government and the ways in which the local rulers who had ruled historically for hundreds of years were being toppled and replaced with short-term bureaucrat warlords who wanted to make money. And so as these relationships change, as the centralization changes, as the colonization changes, you have increased efforts to try to maintain some sort of autonomy, especially in the mountains. And I think that's what Mirhan de Madian was up to. I don't think he was planning a rebellion. It's one of these points that actually uh, a lot of Turkish nationalist writers claim, but there's very little evidence that there was any rebellion in the mountains. This is a question that's unfortunately way outside my research, but I can only speculate and say that it's complex because um, when I went to Mush and elsewhere in Turkey, I met people who identified as part Armenian and part Kurdish. And so the question of how they fit, how they identified is very complicated. And also again, um, one of the things that's fascinating to me about places like Sof Garabet, uh, basically to your question, I don't know. But the, just to kind of riff off that question, places like Sot Garabet were venerated by the Kurdish communities who did live there. Um, and I speculate that some of them, some of their ancestors had also been Zoroastrians in antiquity. Um, that the Kurdish people in the mountains had lived side by side with Armenians for millennia. So, so to Mush itself, up until the end, up until 1915, it was almost completely Armenian. But the mountains were mixed and incredibly complicated. They had people like the Belekli, who we would have a hard time perhaps fitting into Kurdish or Armenian. Uh, they practiced certain Armenian rituals. They revered the Armenian saints. Uh, some of them were closely allied with various Armenian villagers, 
So it gets very complicated very quickly. When you get into the mountains in general, you have a wealth of diversity that you don't have in the lowlands. And so lots of people up there, the question of how they identify is complicated and to be, to be honest, I don't know how they would identify themselves. Thank you very much. Let's give a big hand to Dr. Owen. This concludes our event, so next week we have another lecture and that will be our end of the series. Thank you very much. And please help yourself with the books that we have outside. It's complimentary.